Take your Bibles and turn to uh, Matthew chapter 7. Hey, we're just about through the, the Sermon on the Mount so that you can know where we are. Chapter 7 finishes that sermon, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. But we want to talk about the, the golden rule today. If I ask you what was the golden rule, you'd say, oh, yeah, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. But leading up to that, think about what the Old Testament people were always taught. I'll start this, the sentence, you finish it out. An eye for a, and a tooth for a tooth. Hey, let's, let's do them in. You know, that's what they heard all that kind of Old Testament time. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes along and he changes the paradigm. Now, you know, sometimes you use that word. Some, maybe some of you haven't used that word. A paradigm, we talk about a paradigm shift. Here's the way it used to be done. Uh, one major paradigm shift is we used to have a little schoolhouse. And how many grades were in that little schoolhouse? All of them. And so when a kid was in kindergarten, he, he, was, he was hearing what the second graders were studying. And when a kid was in sixth grade, he was getting a review of the second grade because there was a second grader in there. And it was a paradigm. And all of a sudden, that paradigm started to shift. And we said, okay, we need grades for each group and... That kind of stuff. Paradigms have shifted over the years in many different ways. Um, the Swiss watch company, years ago, they, they loved that, that expensive watch that the, the second hand would sweep around and it had all those expensive parts. And when you worked someplace for 25 years, what'd they give you? They gave you a watch. They want to make sure you're still going to be on time. And and people are really, wow, that was so valuable because it was a watch. Did you know that the Swiss watch company designed the first digital watches? Remember when digital watches came along? You know, and the Swiss had it. They matter of fact, when they had one of their clock conferences and stuff, they had this little digital thing out there, but they said, nobody's ever gonna want a digital watch. So they sold it to Seiko. And what did Seiko end up doing? Man, they're make, they made money hand over fist and all just raking in. And the Swiss developed it, but they didn't keep up with the paradigm change. There's another paradigm change that's coming. Uh, most people don't even, I, I don't even wear a watch anymore. And many of you don't either because somebody says, what time is it? And you grab your cell phone and you go, oh, it's, it's 10.05. And so why do I have to have a watch when I got, you know, you always have your phone right there. And so you just pull out your phone. Now, if you have a watch today, I would almost guarantee that it's not brand new. You didn't just go out and buy it this week. As a matter of fact, I went to look for a watch, you know, just to see it's kind of hard. They used to have a whole, in the jewelry store, you had the whole watch section. Not anymore, because the paradigm is what? Shifted. Shifted. So I've told you in school how it shifted. I told you in watches how it shifted. Let me give you another example. When it came to the piano, the piano wasn't even invented until the 1700s or so. You know what it was before that? The harpsichord. And you know what the harpsichord does? It's like taking a harp. You've heard somebody play a harp, you know, and they've strummed the thing, you know, and they and they plucked at it. It's like taking a harp and setting it on its side. And then there are little hooks that pluck the harp. And so when it plays, it's plucking. The chord. It's kind of hard to get much volume out of it because it's just bing, bing, you know, and it's just plucking away. A guy decided, I'm going to change that. I'm going to do away with the hooks. I'm going to put some hammers, some felt hammers in there. And all of a sudden, the piano became the, one of the main instruments. We don't even have a harpsichord today. But the piano became this volume kind of thing and the expression and you have the Rachmaninoffs and others that came because of that paradigm shift. Jesus came 
And the Jewish people had heard, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. And Jesus said, but, but I tell you, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And he started that golden rule. So let's read Matthew 7, 1 through 12, and, and just put it in its context. Because verse 12 is the golden rule. And it's a part of this Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is giving this, this chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew up on the mountainside in Galilee. Here's what he says. Do not judge so that you won't be judged. For with the judgment you use, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but don't notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye and look, there's a log in your eye. Hypocrite. First take the log out of your eye and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Don't give. And if you can just kind of hear this, I'm reading it at this point, but think of Jesus on that hillside and he's giving this to thousands of people. And he says, don't give what is holy to dogs or toss pearls before pigs. Now, what kind of people was he talking to? What nationalities? Jewish people. Jewish people didn't eat any unclean animals. What were unclean animals? Dogs and pigs. I mean, when's the last time you had a dog for lunch? Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, in some countries, they do eat dogs or cats or other things. But for them, Jesus was all of a sudden taking his fingers on a chalkboard and going, and they're going, because what does he say to them? Don't give what is holy to dogs or toss your pearls before pigs or they will trample them with their feet. Turn and tear you to pieces. Keep asking and it will be given you. Keep searching and you will find. Keep knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who searches finds. And to the one who knocks, you know, the door will be opened. What man among you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven, give good things to those who ask him. Therefore. Now this is, this is the golden rule that he's dropping in. After all these verses, therefore, whatever you want others to do for you, do also the same for them. This is the law and the prophet. And again, what do we call this? The golden rule. The Bible doesn't call it the golden rule. This was the name that people gave it. Oh, this is a really good rule. Man, this is the, this is the gold standard. Because we used to use gold as the money standard in our society. Then it was, oh, it's a golden rule. That's, uh, this is the standard for people. Let me give you uh, this. This is a, a store today. I've covered over the name, the t- today's name, because it used to be called the Golden Rule Company. Anybody know what it, which company it was? Besides people that were here the last service? J.C. Penney. And here's the story behind it. Let me even pull it down here so you can see. It's, it's more clear on the panels there. Where our bulbs are going out. Actually, we just bought new bulbs. So I don't know what's going on. And when you buy new bulbs, they're $800. So you, you want to make sure that they're right and work. In, 19, in 1898, a young man began working for a small chain of stores in western United States called the Golden Rule Stores. In 1902, the owners, uh, Guy Johnson and Thomas Callahan, impressed by a young man's work ethic and salesmanship, 
offered him a one-third partnership in the new store he would open. The young man made the investment and moved to Wyoming to open a store there. He participated in opening two more stores. And when Callahan and Johnson dissolved their partnership in 1907, the young man purchased full interest in all three stores. By 1912, there were 34 stores in the Rocky Mountain states. In 1913, the young man moved the company to downtown uh, Salt Lake City. The company was incorporated under the new name, J.C. Penny Company. But what was the original name? The Golden Rule Store. Why? J.C. Penny's father was an unpaid Baptist pastor. What was their standard? Want to treat others? as I'd want to be treated. And for years, J.C. Penney did very well. I, I think they've taken a, a bath the last couple of years. And maybe they need to go back to the, the gold standard. You know, do unto others, yeah, then do unto you. What are they looking for? But that's the background. We use the golden rule in our society in many different ways. Sometimes people use it like this. It's a little bitty cartoon area there. Little guy's up on his thrown over the audience down below and he's pointing his finger and he's saying to them, remember the golden rule. And some little guy down below hollers back up, what's that? And some guy on the far right says, whoever has the gold makes the rules. And that's how we, you know, and that's how we kind of play with the, the golden rules. Some people even have said it this way, uh, instead of doing to others as you have them do unto you, do unto others before they do it unto you. And, you know, kind of a backhanded slap at the way they do things. Here's the entire text, the 12 verses. It is verse 12, but the paragraph is verses 1 through 12. When you write a letter, when you do something, you try to put things in kind of a paragraph form. Let me show you how this comes about. Let me just deal with the upper half for a moment, verses 1 through 6. We've already preached on verses 1 through 6 and just focused on not the judge. We've already preached on verses 7 through 12 on how to pray, how to keep asking, keep searching, keep knocking. But let me give you this. The first part of this is what not to do. Do not judge. Do not give what is holy to dogs. Do not toss your pearls before pigs. Now, if you were just going to have a religion that was filled with, don't do this, don't do this, and don't do this, and don't do this, after a while you say, is there anything we can do? Jesus starts out, don't do this, don't judge. The second part, let me slide it up here, verses 7 through 12, he says this, keep asking, keep searching, keep knocking. This is what to keep on doing. So it's not like he says, let me take all these things from you. No, you can't do this. Oh, you can't do that. Oh, you can't do this. He says, don't judge. Don't take what's holy and throw it out there to ungodly situations. But let me give you something to do. Keep asking, keep praying, keep knocking. And so this is the second part of that. Then you get to verse 12. After he said, don't do this and continue to do this, Verse 12, he says, therefore, on the basis of verse 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, on the basis of that, therefore, here's what I want you to do. Do unto others. And he goes, therefore, whatever you want others to do for you, do also the same for them. With that emphasis, do all, also the same for them. After I preached this the first service, one mother came up to me. And said, her little four-year-old son said, Mom, it is okay that I hit my older brother. Because he hit me. And that's obvious what he wants me to do to him then. Since he hit me, then he's, I'm going to do unto him as he's done to me. And she said, oh my goodness, a four-year-old is walking this through their minds. How they can get away. You know, isn't it amazing how we can twist things like that? So do the same for them. The Greek word that's used here is poete. 
And I'll, I'll just throw it out there for now. Let's go the second time in scripture that you see the golden rule. And it's in Luke chapter 6, verse 31. And it virtually says it the same way. Just as you want others to do for you, do the same for them. Greek word here, poete, poete. Let me slide it up there and say this. This is a verb imperative. It's present active. It's second person plural. So if I started with the last one, here's what he's saying. It's not, I need to do to others what I want them to do to me. It's not about me. It's, uh, I need to do this. That's first person. It's not third person. He needs to do this. It's about him and not about everybody else. It's second person plural, and that is you. Every one of you, second person, you, and Jesus is speaking to over 5,000. It's not like he's just speaking to the disciples. Every one of you, and it's plural. It's not just you need to do this. It is hands spread wide to all of you need to do this. Got it? That's the Greek word that's used. It's present active. It's in the imperative. So let me slide down here and say, if it's in the imperative, this is a command. This is not the golden suggestion. You know, or how to win friends and influence people. You know, you get, you get the book that was written on that. There were a couple of things that people like to hear their names. So use their names when you're talking to them. Walter, it's so good to have you here today. And people go, oh, he knew my name and he used my name. And then do unto others as you have them to you. Walter, is there anything I can do to help you today? Oh, a thousand dollar check, that would help. <laughs> you know, this is not how to win friends and influence people. This is how God wants you to live. It's a command. Did you get that? It's a, an imperative. It's not a request. And I said to you, it's present active. So when I say that, it means it's continuous. It's right in the present. Right now, you need to do this. And tomorrow, it's going to be, right now, you need to do this. And the next day, it's always going to be in what tense? The present tense. It's not the past, you know. You were his workmanship. It's you are his workmanship. He's working on you today. He'll be working on you tomorrow. This present, continuous, ongoing tense. So this is the Greek word that's used in both of these commands. So it's a command. So here's what I'm putting on the screen. We are commanded to do to others what we want them to do for us. Now, how do you obey that command? I mean, where did he tell you to go? Well, let me say it this way. I'm going to ask you to raise four questions that will show you how, how to obey this command. I would say that Almost every sermon I read or hear and deal with this text almost isolates verse 12 or just lightly gets at it. But what does, how does he start verse 12? Therefore. J. J. Vernon McGee, remember him? Dr. J. Vernon McGee. The guy that kind of talked like this and, you know, I had that southern draw. He said... When you say therefore, always ask what it's there for. You know, so that there's a reason it's there. Ask why it's there. What's it, what is it there for? It's there to take you back to verses 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. In the context. So in the context, let me have you raise some questions on how to obey this command. What is he telling us in this command? Do to others as you'd have them do to you. So here's a question. How do you want others to judge you? If you're going to treat others this way, then how do you want others to judge you? How you want others to judge you is, oh, be easy on me. Go, you know, don't, don't put me in the spot. Don't. Now, if you want people to judge you that way, how do you think they want to be judged? Let's look at the text. Do not judge so that you won't be judged. For with the judgment you use, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, like if somebody says, hey, can I have 
can I have a, a cup of this? And if they shortchange you, what do you say? Hey, uh, a little more? Or if they use, it always amazes me uh, when you read in the paper, when you go for wood, for somebody that doesn't know, whether you buy a cord of wood, whether it's a full cord of wood, or it's, uh, anybody know the other term? A running cord? One of them is a four by four by eight. One of them is a four by three by eight. And so they advertise it as a cord, but you don't know what kind of cord it is. You know, give me the whole, measure it the way you'd want to be measured. Do you want a full cord of wood or do you want a running cord of wood? Well, if you pay the full price for a cord of wood, what do you want? You want a cord of wood. And so he says, that's the kind of measurement. If you want to measure to people how you measure them, it's going to be measured to you. Let me say it this way. <clears throat> Wiersbe says, the tense of the verb judged signifies a once for all final judgment. You will be judged. For the judgment you use, you will be judged. When? For we must all stand before when? The judgment seat of Christ. Hebrews 9.27. For we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of the things done in the body. It's appointed in a man once to die, but after this, the what? Judgment. Judgment. So what he's saying there is, if you're going to be judging, you know, you're setting yourself up for this final judgment. Or Bonhoeffer says it this way, by judging others, we blind ourselves to our own evil and to the grace which others are just as entitled to as we are by judging them that particular way. So let me give you some ideas about how you should judge. Did you know something? The Bible never commands us uh, not to discern and judge, even judge our own selves. When somebody's really in sin, when somebody's living in sin and you go to talk to them, what do they often, if they get, if they get upset about it, what do they say? Judge not lest you be judged. You know, the Bible says you're not supposed to judge. They know that verse. Why do they know that one? Because, man, it's going to get them. They think they can stonewall you <clears throat> and uh, backing off and not confront the sin in their hearts and lives. God, throughout his word, talks about judging. There's even, there's even one book called Judges. You know, God says, you know, that you are to encourage one another and hold each other accountable and use discernment and judgment. So let me give you some guidelines when it comes to judging because you're going to be judged and you're going to judge people at times. First thing is this, judge yourself first. And let me say it this way, 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we should not be judged. You know where that's taken from? The communion service. When you have communion together and God's word says, let a man examine his heart and then let him eat, let him drink. We examine our own hearts. I don't examine your heart. How, where do we start? We judge who? Ourselves first. That's where it needs to start. Secondly, let me give you another one. After you've judged yourself first, then don't judge when God's word is silent. There are a lot of things in our society that people say, oh, why are you doing that? And believe me, there are a lot of times when we as parents say to our kids, no, you're not doing that. I'll give you an example. One time uh, our son said to, to me, uh, can I go next door and play with uh, one of the little guys in the neighborhood? Little guy's name was Andrew. I said, Oh, I don't know. I don't. No, I. I said I don't have any biblical reason why you can't go. Did you, did you hear how I handled that? I just be right honest. I don't have any biblical reason why you can't go, but I don't know their parents. And I and I. You know, I know Andrew. He's been by our house. But I don't know their parents, and I don't know what goes on in the house. That was in the, the morning, and I, and I said, Doug, 
you know, all I can say is, will you just trust me on this one? I don't know why God is saying no. Later on that day, the little guy in the neighborhood was beating on our door. When I went to the door, blood was coming off his forehead. And his grandma had thrown something at him. And he's bleeding out of the head. And Doug's eyes were as big as saucers. What's going on? You know, Because when you bleed from your head, it could be a little cut, and it looks like, man, you're going to bleed to death. And Doug's looking, and later on I said to Doug, you know, remember when I said, I don't have any reason, biblical reason. I just feel like I just don't know and that I don't know them and I don't know what's going on. And so we called the, the parents and got things settled down and did that. But I had no biblical reason to say no to it. So just be honest. It's not wrong to say to your kids, you know, I don't know why, but I just don't have peace in my heart about you going and I don't really have any biblical reason. It's just, except that I don't have peace. Will will you just trust me on this one? Believe me, Doug got it later that day when I said to him, remember when I said, I don't have any biblical reason, but I just don't have peace? And when Andrew shut up the door and he's bleeding, I'm glad you weren't over at the house. And then later on, when I needed to have a decision that wasn't any biblical issue, I could just say, you know, know, and it didn't happen often, but I'd say, remember that situation with Andrew? I I feel the same way. I just, I don't have any reason biblically to say no. So when you come to judge, judge yourself first. Say, okay, am I in the wrong here? And Lord, what needs to be changed about my heart and life? Secondly, Don't judge anything where God's word is silent. When God's word is silent, we're silent. When God's word speaks, we speak. That's why it's so difficult at times. Uh, There are areas that I personally don't do, but God's word doesn't command me, doesn't give me, doesn't command me that I can't do that. For instance, I don't drink alcohol. I don't smoke. But that doesn't make me a good person. And doing those things doesn't make me a bad person. But God doesn't say, thou shall not drink. What does he say? Don't get drunk. Now, I wish he almost said, thou shalt not drink. Because sometimes people get into that and they get drunk and they have accidents. I know um, when, when officers arrest people that are drunk, the bill ends up being, for that drunk person, a minimum of around $4,000. Or a suspended license for a DUI. Or paying this big fine the first time. And then the second time it goes up from there. It doesn't pay. That That's an expensive martini or whatever they had. So when God's word is silent, you be silent. Let me give you an example of that. Uh, my My wife grew up in a church where... They kept, they kept the dietary laws, the Old Testament dietary laws. So they didn't eat ham, and they didn't eat pork items, and they didn't eat dogs, and, and, they, and they didn't uh, have lobster, anything that was classified as an unclean animal in the Old Testament. They didn't eat horses even. Okay. In Colossians 2.16, here's what God's word says. Therefore, don't let anyone judge you in regards to what? food. So if you eat ham, can you eat ham? Yep. And God's word even says so in the New Testament. It doesn't say you may now eat ham. (laughs) It says whatever you eat, it was received with thanksgiving. And then he gives you that opportunity to do that. Is it as healthy as the other things? I don't know. I'm not a doctor in that sense. But Therefore, don't let anyone judge you in regards to food or drink or in the matter of a festival. Oh, how come you're not celebrating? This is Easter. This is Resurrection Sunday. Is that any different than any other Sunday? The Lord is, he's risen. He's risen indeed. This Sunday, 
Every Sunday of the year? Yeah. Is it any different? So I don't, you know, don't make a big deal to say to the kids, this is Easter Sunday. Yeah, this is an important one. This is Christmas. You need to be here. We don't even know when Jesus was born. But we take a day and say, let's remember the birth of Christ. Or a new moon or a Sabbath day. Oh, today's a Sabbath, so you can't walk any further than a Sabbath day's journey. Now the Lord says, every day is a day of worship for us as a New Testament believer. And if you want to worship on Saturday, go ahead. We'll cheer you on. But you don't have to. To say, to glorify God. Because let's just worship the Lord every day. Let's go on. If you're going to be judging, judge yourself first. Don't, don't judge where God's word is silent. Thirdly, pray for good judgment ability. How do I know what to judge? Well, ask God to give you the ability to judge wisely. Not to hurt people in your judgment. This is 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 9. So give your servant an obedient heart to do what? To judge. This is why we know that God's word doesn't command you. You don't judge people, but you don't judge them in a way that puts you up and looks down on them. You are discerning and you judge between what is righteous, what is good, what is evil in your own heart and then in your children's lives and then in fellow believers' lives. And you challenge them. How do you feel about doing this? Is there any biblical command on this? So, give your servant an obedient heart to judge your people and to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? So ask God to give you a discerning heart. Let me give you the last thing here. I've got the first three. One more. Show mercy. So what, did, what was the question I said do unto others as you have them do unto you? The first question was, how do you want them to judge you? Well, how do you want them to judge you? Well, you want them to judge their, their, their own lives first. You want them to not judge you outside the word of God. You want them to have good judgment, discernment, when they do judge you and try to nudge you towards righteousness. And lastly, you want them to show what? Mercy. You want them to hammer you? No, you want them to be merciful to you. Let me give you the verse, Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You pay a tenth of mint and dill and cumin, yet you have neglected the more important matters of the law. What he's saying is, you know, you tithe. You say, oh, man, I gave a tenth of this. and I gave a tenth of that. And I, oh, I really did all those things. And he says, but you, yet you've neglected the more important matters of the law, that of justice, that of mercy. And then he goes on, these things uh, should have been done. What things? Justice, mercy, faith. These things should have been done without neglecting the other. Go ahead and give. It's not bad to give, but your giving has overlooked the other. So show mercy. So let's go back. I said to you, we got a command from the Lord. I've asked you to raise four questions in your own heart. First one is this. How do you want others to judge you? The second one is this. How do you want others to correct you? <clears throat> but even before that, let me give you an example. In, I, I've been the pastor here for 26 years. Before that, I was a pastor for 10 years at a church in Indiana. The church in Indiana, <clears throat> I had a, we had one family that was, at times, not a, as stable as other families. And it had to do with really the dad. The dad would up, and when he was spiritually high, everybody in the family was whipped into shape, you know. And then when he was kind of down... So I'll give you an example of one of the areas that he was, he'd get focused on. They had a TV in their home. God would convict him. No TV. So his two teenage children go, no TV. You know, they wanted to watch maybe a favorite program of theirs. So he'd unplug the TV 
put it up in the closet. Nobody could watch TV because God had convicted him. Now he's the, he's the dad. He's well, the head of the family kind of thing. So he, you know, pulled that rank and put the TV away. But then, so the TV's away for a week or two. And then he has a favorite program that he wants to watch. And what happened to the TV? It came back out. Now the TV's plugged in. The kids are going, oh, thank God, Dad saw the light. Until the next time. TV's unplugged, back up in the closet. That's not the way to, that's not the way to teach your kids. If it's a conviction, it should be based on the Word of God, and it doesn't change. If it's a preference, it can be based on opinion, and it can change. Did you hear the difference? So teach your kids convictions based on the word. Then when you're not around, they'll know what to do. And they'll know areas that they have freedom. And they'll know areas that they just hold the line on. So this family uh, was a little bit unstable at times. One night the police got called over to their home. I'm the pastor. I didn't even know about it until the next day. Because one of our people happened to have a police scanner at their home. This goes back years now, you know. I mean, come on. I've been here 26 years. I doubt that anybody, anybody here have a police scanner? You got one. Of course, he does the community thing and, and helps out with the police department. But most people... You don't, yeah, you got enough busy stuff without, but she was listening to this police, police scanner that night. So the next morning she calls me and she says, pastor, is everything okay over at so-and-so's house? Now this is a community of 35,000 people. And I said, you know, I don't know why. She says, well, I had the police scanner on last night and the police were called over to their house. And, I, and if, they, if something, if somebody's broken into their house, if we can help them or if something's happened, you know, I want to provide food or, you know. But if it's, if it's something bad, I don't want to know about it, you know. And don't tell them that I called you. So I'm like this now, you know. You got the balls in the air. You're, you know it's, something's happened, but you don't know what's happened. So... As as a pastor, what do you want to do? You want to shepherd people. Now you know there's some concern. So I uh, talked with uh, their son that, that evening at our prayer meeting, and and I said to him, "Hey, everything okay at your house?" Yeah. Why? I said, "Well," and I had to be very cautious here because I didn't hear it, and I didn't want them to think I'd heard it and didn't come or something. So I said to him, "Well." It was on the police scanner last night that they were at your house. Oh, yeah, it was a neighbor. There was a fight with one of the neighbors. Right, yeah, everything's okay. And so when I saw the dad, I said, hey, I hear you had some trouble last night. And, and how would you know? And now I didn't want to say, well, you know, the other woman here over here, you know, I mean, you can try to go into the deals. I could have said, you know, one of our women was concerned, and if you needed some help, but there are other people around. And so I said, well, it was on the police scanner. And he thought, oh, I was one of the police chaplains, like Pastor Mark is one of the police chaplains here. We had 15 police chaplains. They all served two duty days, 48 hours straight. He had the police car, the radio, the stuff. And so he thought, oh. So he put that in his heart and thought, you know, my pastor heard this and didn't even care enough to call or come. But that wasn't the case. I, I didn't even know. And as soon as I knew, then we said something. But at that point, he let that lodge in his heart. And, and what I'm saying to you is that can happen to you. Either way, you can be on the receiving end or you can be on the other end, on the giving end. You don't know what people have really heard, so ask him if it's starting to hurt you. 
as it was, I didn't even know this was going on. And so a few weeks went by and, and it finally erupted because when, when you take an offense against somebody, what do you do? You become bitter. And so one Sunday morning during one of the, uh, our first service, we had two services. During the first service, they were in Sunday school class and he erupted uh, in the Sunday school class. Oh yeah, our pastor did this and doesn't even care. And instead of just dealing with it with me, of course, he was the same guy with the TV that gets put away and then taken out and put away and taken out. So it's hard to have people that are just going to be consistent. And so in front of everybody, he said, oh, our pastor did this, and they didn't even come over. And somebody said, well, have you talked to him about it? Well, no. So I didn't even know this was going on, first service. Get in the second service, and he usually sits right, he sat right about in here in this area. We started the service, sang one song, and and I, and often I, you know, I would say to somebody, "Hey, would you lead us in prayer?" You know, and that Sunday I didn't know, and who'd I ask to lead us in prayer? But this guy. And I said, "Hey, would you lead us in prayer?" And I didn't know what had gone on. All of a sudden, his head bolted up. He said, "No, no, no, I won't." And I go, okay, they didn't tell me what to do in seminary about this. You know? <laughs> and we met, and, and he wouldn't listen to how it came down, and I didn't want to get the older, the, the woman that had listened to that. You know? But what do we want? We want mercy. So when you, how do you want people to correct you? We want them to show mercy. Here's what the text says. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the log in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and look, there's a log in your eye. Hypocrite. First take the log out of your eye, and then you'll see clear to take the, the speck out of your brother's eye. This gets right back to that judgment. Remember the first thing you do on judging? Who do you judge first? Judge yourself first. Get the log out of your eye. Every one of us has a blind spot. I didn't know that until I was older and had to go to the optometrist and he had a chart in front of him and he says, okay, why don't you close one eye and, and look? He said, I want to move the pen around. You tell me when you can't see it. I'm thinking, what do you mean you can't see it, you know? And all of a sudden I, I couldn't see it. And I thought, my eyes are going bad. <laughs> he says, okay, do the other side. Every place where your optic nerve attaches to your eye and goes to your brain that's a dead spot. That's a blind spot. You don't see there. You only see on the rest of the eye, not where it attaches to the retina. And so every one of us has two blind spots. And I have blind spots. And you have blind spots. So how do I want people to correct me? Well, when it comes to the blind spots, I want to ascertain their hearts. I want to know, did they do it because they, they were bitter and wanted to get at and so let me give you this illustration with a, with a child. When you say to your child, be careful with that glass, or you're going to dump it. And if they look at you and go, and then take their hand and smack it over, now we've got war. <laughs> now we've got some discipline issues. But if they're, you know, you're at a picnic and you're outside and, it's all hot and they're all sweaty and their hands are sweaty and they pick up the glass and it slips out and they dump it. What do you say? It's an accident. And so you're trying to ascertain their heart. And you know when a child is going and smacks the glass over, it's an intentional. What are you going to do about it? Look. And that's what you want to ascertain when you're do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Say, where is the blind spot here? Where is the judgment here? Let me show it to you this way. Uh, if you go online, if you type in blind spot, you'll see a little test. They have a blind spot test. It looks something like this on one of the sites. And they'll tell you to cover one eye and you cover the left eye and look at the star. Just focus on the star. And you'll see the other one in the peripheral vision, but you'll move a point where all of a sudden it's gone. Or cover your right eye with the left eye and look at the circle and then get closer and closer to the screen as you do keep focused on that circle and you'll and come a point where you won't see the star 
Because you have a blind spot. And what we don't understand, the reason God gave us two eyes is to cover the blind spots. The reason God gave you a mate so she can cover the blind spots. <laughs> Did I say that correctly? Wives? I didn't hear any amens out of you women. <laughs> so she can cover the blind spots and correct us. Okay. So we're commanded, we're commanded to treat others like we want to be treated. I'm giving you four questions. What do you want? How do you want others to judge you? How do you want others to correct you? Thirdly, how do you want others to pray for you? Because it's all in the same context here. Now you, of course, can focus on just judging and deal with that. We did that one week. And praying, and we did that one week. But now he's at the conclusion. Therefore, here's the golden rule. How do you want others to judge you? Stop judging them. Judge them the way you would want to be judged. Judge. When you correct them, show mercy. When you pray for them, what's the text say? Keep asking and it will be given you. Keep searching and you will find. Keep knocking and the door will be open to you. Here's what we said when we looked at this text. This is an imperative. You are to keep asking, keep searching, keep knocking not a request you are commanded to pray it's in the present tense which means it's continuous you're going to continually do this that's why the christian standard bible translates it keep asking keep searching it's the only translation that does that all the others say ask and it'll be given to you seek and you'll find knock the door shall be open but the woman wanted to emphasize the greek here Keep doing this. It's continuously. It's an imperative. So do it. He goes on, it's active voice, and it's second person plural. And what do we learn about second person plural? It's not about me. It's not about him. It's about all of us. You, every one of you, do this. Now, what do we want to be doing? We want to be praying for other people. We always, When we interpret this text, we keep thinking, we need to keep asking. We need to keep asking. For who? For whom do we pray? God, take care of my son. God, take care of my daughter. God, bless us for and no more. You know, that's not what God taught us to pray. Prayer is about others. Pray that the Lord would send out laborers. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are what? Few. So he's talking about praying for others. Now, this is also praying about us, but... It's in the context of how you treat others. How do you want to treat others? You pray for them. Let me uh, go on with the text here. For everyone who asks, receive, and the one who searches, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. What man among you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those that ask him? I've already told you about these little kids. This is one of the little twins that's going to be dedicated. This is another one of the little twins going to be dedicated. Now let me read you the letter from their mom. Hi, Pastor Madison. I just wanted to thank you and everyone that prayed for our twins. We are truly, they are truly God's blessing to us. Khaleesi is our daughter, and Gunnar II, named after his grandpa Will, is our son. These children are miracles. For 12 years, we prayed for a child, and for 12 years, I thought his answer was no. When in reality, it was not yet. After years of treatments and one failed IVF cycle, we had only one chance left. And even then, one embryo wasn't dividing. But miraculously, before the doctor rejected it, he looked one last time, and that embryo had rapidly divided overnight and caught up to the other one. Today, 
we are blessed with twins. They were born January 28th, but they weren't due until May 9th. I spent two weeks in the hospital trying to stave off labor. They were 25 weeks and four days when they came into this world. Weighing one pound, 12 ounces each. Can you imagine how small that is? I mean, uh, a little a can of Coke is 12 ounces. And 16 is a pound, so you, you almost you have you know a little larger than a can of Coke. You have two little Coke bottles or something. They have been through so much. They were both airlifted to UCLA in February to have heart surgeries called PDA legations. It was to close the holes in their hearts. They came back to AV Hospital later that month. Today, Khaleesi is 9 pounds, 6 ounces, and Gunner is 8 pounds, 13 ounces. So many people prayed for us. Do you hear this? This is where it's going. So many people prayed for us. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. Do you want people praying for you when there's needs? Yeah. What is she saying? Oh, I'm so glad that God heard your prayers. So many people prayed for us. I spent hours in prayer. We had and still have so many people praying for us. There were very hard times, but the Lord got us through them. Our daughter came home April 9th and our son April 11th. He came home on oxygen, but blessedly he, is, he no longer requires it. I just can't begin to describe the awesomeness of our Lord. Every time I look at the children, I thank the Lord God for them. Yes, even at 3 a.m. They are a true testimony to God's greatness. And even in our darkest moments, he is there to carry us through. Grateful for the prayers of God's people. Do unto others as you'd have them do to you. That includes praying. So keep praying, keep searching, keep knocking, and the door is going to be what? Open. Let me just give you at least the last question. How do you want others to judge you? How do you want others to correct you? How do you want others to pray for you? And lastly, how do you want others to treat you? And do unto others as you have them do to you. The text is it this way. Therefore, whatever you want others to do for you, do also the same for them. This is the law and the prophets. You know something? There are some people that they just want to cook for you. Let them. There are other people that want to give you a ride if you need it. There are other people that want to be a listening ear if you need it. There are other people that want to give you money if you need it. There are other people that, what do you want? Depends on where you are. This guy, <clears throat> what do you think he wanted? <laughs> you know something? It always amazes me. There are times when God lets us experience some things like this. Audrey and I, I'm trying to get back in health. It's been nine weeks now since the surgery. And, and so I haven't done any running yet. I don't want to jar my insides, but we do a lot of walking. And on Friday, I have Fridays off. And so Friday, Audrey and I went for a bike ride. And I thought, okay, we've, this is the second week we did it the previous Friday. And so Friday, we're out for a bike ride. We went 10 miles. Uh, we went up into Lancaster and all of a sudden, Audrey's tire on the front, the whole the whole valve stem just blew right off. And I'm thinking, okay, well, at least I know I have an inner tube in my back little packet. But I open the back little packet, and I go, oh, my tools are on the counter at our home. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I'll take it off and I'll take out the old inner tube and I'll stuff the new one in as best I can. Now, how do I get the, I need a screwdriver to kind of put it in place. 
So I finally, when I fussed around enough, I had taken about an hour at 11 o'clock in the morning, you know, when the sun is starting to come up, you know. I, I went across to the guy, the neighbor's house, knocked on the door. And I said, you know, uh, I pointed over to my wife. I said, my wife and I are out on a bike ride, kind of make you a little bit at ease. Some guy with a ba- uh, the bicycle helmet on, you know, and looking like, oh, what are you doing here? I said, all I need is one flathead screwdriver. Do you have a flathead screwdriver? He said, yes. I was glad that he gave it to me. I was wanting to do unto others as you'd have them doing to you. I think, oh, that's great. How do you want others to treat you? When you need something, you're glad they did it. But you know something? Later on when I got back home, I took my tire repair kit out, and I said, you know something? I have just the tool in there that I needed, and it was with me. (laughs) But God wanted me to go over and have to ask for help. And all I want to say to you is, you know, this golden rule thing, it's not a suggestion. It's a command. And for the Lord to reveal it to your heart, just ask yourself the questions that weave through the text. And then start loving on people. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, you taught us so many lessons from other people. But I pray that you teach us from your word how to teach other, how to lead, how to love other people, how to treat other people in a godly way. Father, we would confess we're not very good at this at times. But use us as a way to open up people to trust you by the kindness that we demonstrate to them. In Jesus' name, amen.